Well, um, as I as I begin talking, thank you everybody for joining this morning um, on on this talk about. Uh, I was struggling a bit at how I could address this group and the interest that this group might have. And then I thought, well, um, I'm the colleague of the dry land ecosystem specialist group of the IUCN. This is one of the hats. The others is that I'm also the land degradation adv advisor for the UN Global Environment Facility. And I did serve um, a term as a sci in the science policy interface of the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. So the issues along, around land restoration, ecosystem restoration, the focus on dry lands um, is core to me and, uh, and the concept of land degradation neutrality. Uh, so I. I first thought to organize a talk around um, one um, one talk that uh, or one sentence that the the IUCN uh, put forward at the last uh, conference of the parties of the UNCCD, and that was a bit of a reflection on on the importance of drylands globally. So we did this work with the uh, global drylands uh, um, program of the IUCN. And, and we were reflecting on the importance of uh, dry lands and on the importance of managing dry lands sustainably to achieve what one of the targets of goal uh, 15, which is the, the strive to achieve land degradation neutrality. Um, so this is a bit of um, the guiding or the thread of, of my talk today. And I thought it was important that um, I let you know a, a tiny bit where I where I'm going. So I thought this important. I'm not sure how you all are conversant with dry land. So I, I, one slide or two as to what how I see that dry, dry lands contribute to the world and other scientists that work within this same field as I do. What are the concerns around that? Um, and then I'm not, uh, again, I was not sure how many of you uh, know very well about land degradation neutrality. So I will, um, if you if you're already know very well about land degradation neutrality, this might sound a bit of a repetition and I um, apologize for that. Um, but then say, if we think in terms of uh, this is a framework, the land degradation neutrality, uh, how could we envisage uh, good responses to address many of the issues around dry lands that are guided by this concept of land degradation neutrality? And I also think that, yes, it's good that we all know frameworks and we apply frameworks, but then in the context of developing projects or developing interventions, I always think that um, having these good frameworks is one very important step, but the other is as to how we collectively organize and look and share and exchange knowledge that we need to what we said in the in the UNGF in the um, scientific and technical advisory panel. We, we speak a lot about um, transformational change and the need to um, to make projects uh, more enduring or more sustainable uh, over time. Not only that you work in a project and when the project is over or the funding is over, um, there are no outcomes that last. So one of um, our questions, for instance, is always uh, is, is that we need more knowledge or is that we need to look at the way we organize what we already know, we exploit that and, and then in such a way that we make outcomes more durable. So a bit of like three chunks in my talk uh, today. Um, so how dry lands are important to the world. Okay, I'm, I was trying to leave this, but I can. I seem not to be able to put this one. Um, this is a map of the world, and you can see here what are all the different uh, dry land regions that that we that we have. Um, we always say that uh, in in the dry lands commission we reflect about the importance of dry lands. Um, in terms of area of geography, the coverage is of forty percent of the of the land surface of this world are, are classified or belongs to what we call the dry lands. Um, they are significant for their system functions. Um, we always say that they have a lot of potential for carbon storage, for instance. And I have this map of the rangelands on the left and on the on the right here uh, is uh, is the 
is a map of soil organic carbon potential that also shows uh, how it, even when it's not um, a, a huge uh, amount of carbon sequestration potential is the geographic is the, the extent that um, dry lands offer as a potential sink for uh, soil carbon storage. Uh, they are also a source of biodiversity, but as importantly, is not only the landscape is is what the landscape provides for people for human well-being. Um, we have more than two billion people that the, who and about one billion of them the livelihoods depends on 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 the dry lands. Um, there are a, a, a source of so much traditions and cultures. And, and we say here in Australia that many of, well, we call it here the outback. We say, well, uh, the outback, outback is often the canary in the mind for many of the impacts of climate change. Whenever, if you want to see uh, how things might progress in good or bad ways with uh, climate uh, ex extremes and variability, look at the drylands, but also look at them on the way in which people have responded and have developed resilient answers for drylands over time. So we also say that they are sources of mineral wells, um, the potential for solar power, and uh, the other, so that's on the good, but on the other is that um, acknowledgement that many times dry lands are far away from cities, they are so important for the uh, sustainable and sustainability and many of the ecosystem services that we in the city enjoy, and, and they are they have that relationship of being governed from far away and therefore many times policies do fail to understand the the issues that are proper of of that remoteness of that uh, of that um of that part of the world that we sometimes people like we say here people in Canberra might fail to understand what are the the problems of distance of transport of many things that are uh, essential to develop good policy and good governance for dry lands. So how that's that's in a nutshell the importance of dry lands. Um, where the entry point now comes for land degradation neutrality, and how it could be that that the you know how could that be the response for land degradation um, uh, issues that dry, dry lands face. Um, we, you might have seen this uh, graphic about land degradation neutrality, which uh, is about um, ensuring full security for, for future generations, for us today, while maintaining healthy ecosystems. And, uh, and as we have healthy ecosystems, we also look for uh, ecosystem services that can ensure uh, a human well-being, that can uh, help us in having um, humans living well with sustainable land livelihoods. So this is the, the, the um, these are the three points that uh, the concept of land degradation neutrality uh, tries or the three main aims it tries to achieve. Um, and it has a series of, of um, principles. We have 19 principles and the core is around maintaining or improving the sustainable delivery of these ecosystem services. Um, interventions, uh, it looks at the past, it looks at this balance on, on the what we call the response hierarchy, where you try to avoid new degradation, uh, and wherever you have past degradation, you try to see ways to reverse or to or to reverse or to reduce. So it's, it's trying, is that balance uh, through proper uh, land use planning to, to anticipate where in the landscape, uh, in this case, where in dry lands further degradation might happen, but then what could I do? What are the interventions that could de be developed to counterbalance that um, unavoidable degradation? And in other areas, uh, once you plan and you identify what are the right measures that could be identified to either restore, rehabilitate uh, the, the dry landscapes. Um, the concept is about increasing the resilience of the land and the populations that depend on the land. And it seeks also synergies with other social, economic and environmental objectives. And one of the principles that underpins interventions that promote land degradation neutrality is about is around res uh, responsible and inclusive governance. 
The concept of land degradation neutrality, uh, say working, uh, thinking on dry lands and, and making dry lands uh, no more degraded or neutral to land degradation is, is also important from a point of view that the UN um, a convention to combat the certification did endorse um, LDN as a part of the uh, strategic framework that they had from 2018 until 2030 and has invested a lot of uh, capacity building and, and, inter and, and targets, um, the how to target set uh, to achieve land degradation neutrality. So the concept has been now roll out in, uh, in about 107, uh, 127 countries that have endorsed that concept and that are working through the operational implementation. So it's not um, a concept that is new and IUCN has helped uh, several of the countries that went through the process of LDN target setting. Um, why is also uh, saying the concept of, of you as members of the ecosystem restoration, one of the aspects that we emphasize in the concept of the scientific conceptual framework of land degradation neutrality is that um, from the point of view of a policymaker, it's not just a one-off alternative. Um, because we work with this concept of, of targets, land degradation neutrality targets, and the, the settling of the targets is voluntary for the countries. A country can, de, can choose to what extent, depending on, on their priorities of national development, how, uh, where are they heading? They might decide of, on sets of um, of interventions that might be more leading more to land restoration or the concept of land restoration, while in other la landscape or land types, um, the, the um, striving to achieve land degradation neutrality might be more suitable for interventions that relate to land rehabilitation. Um, so this is, uh, we, we always say, this is the space that a policymaker has to um, to work towards a land degradation neutral, in this case, land degradation neutral dry lands, uh, with a, a range of um, of interventions that can tackle restoration, rehabilitation. The the final aim is that over time uh, you maintain or enhance the ecosystem services of that eco of of dry lands. Uh, and, and that you don't do measures that will contribute to the decline. But the decision space is, is a broad one. And of course, you, you know, there is always this issue um, with experts in land restoration about what, what you, you know, what is the baseline that you use for that land restoration. So that is one of the concepts. And the other is that um, you can, uh, because we work with the, the hierarchy of avoiding, reducing, or reversing, there are many tool sets that we can use that uh, people are already using in many other contexts and, and, and that are being promoted by not only the UNCCD, but, uh, I, but IUCN, like for instance, nature-based solutions. So many of the um, different strategies and approaches that are uh, already being used for for main for common uh, projects or for for um, yeah for projects that have been um, under underway even prior to the concept of land degradation neutrality to come in place um, they these tools are are good vehicles, good ways to deliver on the concept of land degradation neutrality. So I listed here and depending on say on what a, a country might decide will be their targets uh, to achieve, whether they are will going to focus more on avoiding or more on reducing or reversing, you have a set of tools that um, science has proved if they work, that there have been projects that have collected knowledge on how to make them work, how to make them operational. And they are, could be around uh, nature-based solutions, ecosystem-based approaches, um, land use planning, which is essential to any uh, good program or good intervention around land degradation neutrality. You need to plan. So the concept of, of the, the, the earlier figures I showed to you, in the base, there is this concept of anticipate and plan. So 
So land use planning underpins any good intervention around land degradation neutrality. And then technologies, we, we know uh, air observation, geographic information systems, they are all central to any uh, planning for, in this case, if we think about planning around land degradation neutrality in dry lands. Um, and la and the, the other aspect that we work uh, with this concept of LDN is the, the landscape approach. So you might do interventions at a project level, but your thinking has to be around a, a landscape scale um, and within a national context because uh, to us, uh, to the concept of land degradation neutrality, um, the land type, so the, the, the land potential is essential. So let's see how we do this uh, here. Um, for those of you that might not be familiar, the land degradation neutrality framework has what it what we call it five um, modules that goes from from a country or a project setting a vision up to uh, running on the, the important part of um, developing a baseline uh, against which you can measure then how successful you have been in implementing uh, some of your interventions to uh, developing the uh, or to having this decision support system, the, the mechanism, the mechanisms for neutrality, the counterbalance. I can't avoid more degradation. That's that is under is it's understandable that in some circumstances it's very difficult to to not continue for a country or not continue to degrade, but then we work with that concept of the like for like basis. Um, the module then, there is a module to that is uh, on the tools to achieve um, uh, the pathways to implement LDN. And then of course, a, mo a module that monitors um, whether neutrality, how you know how you track towards the targets that you have established. And for that, there are um, baseline indicators. There are three, core global indicators um, that focus uh, on soil organic carbon, on, land, on, on trends in, in, in land productivity, and on trends in land use and land cover change. Of course, this is all, say, um, more on the biophysical or, of, or the socio-ecological aspects, uh, which is preferred that you, you, you look at this not only from a biophysical perspective, but also from a socio, uh, from a, better from a socio-ecological one, uh, but all this has to be underpinned by uh, what we call the LDN enabling environment, which is around uh, policies, which is around uh, good governance. And this is uh, the, where the principles for land degradation neutrality become very important. Okay. Uh, again, we'll try to... Move this one around. So in the in the concept of land degradation neutrality, um, we work with this idea of anticipating future losses, propose future gains, and this is this is this is what balance. This is the principle of the counterbalancing mechanism. Uh, land degradation neutrality has to apply to all land types. We say. Um, and, uh, and we work with this concept of land potential. Land potential is the, the looking at the capability of the land. So any design intervention should, should take into account what is the capability of the land, the land potential. Um, and for that, say, we tend to use um, to information that we have, knowledge that we have from geography that we can collect and, and use in further special analysis within ge a geographic information system, for instance. So we tend to in, take into account the land type, but also the land use. So in dry lands, we, we will be looking at rangelands as a form of, as um, a, a grasslands, rangelands as a form of live, livelihoods and a form of land use. So the important part here is that the LDM mechanism for ne neutrality is what we call the counterbalancing of anticipating these gains and losses that are based on the land-based natural capital with, uh, within unique land types. And those unique land types are essential, it's essential that they be identified as, um, as you plan for your interventions. And then um, the interventions might be directed then to those unique land types using um, a, 
very good land, land management decisions or land use practices that uh, you might have uh, that are suitable for the context you're working on. Um, so how uh, the, we say that then uh, the other good thing about uh, the, the, the framing of the LDN mechanisms, we, when we suggest always that when uh, work begins, uh, the, the logic framework, uh, like this example here, where you identify uh, what are the drivers, uh, what are the pressures that make, say, um, a dry land not, not, not sustainable or, or a dry land might, be, might continue to degrade. So it's very important that uh, in the LDN conceptual framework that any country or any project that plans to do uh, an intervention addressing, L, uh, addressing uh, land degradation to achieve land degradation neutrality, focus on understanding the drivers and the pressures because the, any response that you develop really needs to tackle drivers to ensure that there are changes that will uh, last over time. Um, the, the good things about working with a, a framework like, like this one, we, we always say once we have the, the drivers and the pressures identified, then you can um, understand what might be the long or the short term uh, shocks into the system. And if you have that understanding, then the responses can be um, more directed or more effective towards achieving this counterbalancing uh, and, and designing proper LDN interventions. And as, you, as, as we said here, um, in the concept continues through this um, driver's pressure state uh, impact and responses frame, logic framework, um, you can design responses that might reverse land degradation or might avoid or reduce land degradation. Um, so this ca causal system here um, help any intervention towards land degradation neutrality uh, be uh, done on, in, 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 a, in a frame where you understand what are the, uh, the, how the natural and the social capital interact. And this is then what helps to design a good policy. And this is all again, uh, because we, we work within, within responses that are guided by good governance, um, we can establish the links between land degradation, neutral dry lands as, as our vision, um, bearing in mind uh, principles of good governance for the implementation. Hope is all good so far um, and that I'm making some sense in my 4 a.m. Uh, wake up. Okay. I'm not sure where to put this one, not to, not to uh, be uh, uh, hindering all the all the, the graphics and things. So, the before I move on, the the I want again to emphasize on the importance of of planning for land degradation neutrality um, in the context of dry lands or any other ecosystem for that matter, um, because uh, interventions that that we we do. Um, should should account for whatever a country can report as uh, their work in in achieving land degradation neutrality. So land use planning and and um, and using national land use planning systems as entry points for interventions towards uh, land degradation neutral dry lands is very important from two points of view. First, for a for um a targeted uh, for interventions to be targeted to the uh, context of where you, we want to make it. So we, we there might be, as I said before, uh, changes in the land potential. There might be different cultural or political or social issues that are uh, characteristics of different land uh, ecosystems. And as, as I said at the very beginning, dry lands are very particular in terms of their culture, in terms of the land management practices that are used in terms of the, the systems of governance that they have. So it is important that we're, in as much as possible, um, any intervention is targeted to, uh, to the land use planning uh, system of a country uh, so that 
on one hand you plan and on the other you keep a good tracking of or a good a good tracking and inventory of the success of your interventions and how that that success can add up for the country then to report on how they are tracking towards the, the, the SDG target 15.3 of a land degradation neutrality at the national level. Um, so I said here, the important is this one um, for, for, for the planning to keep track of cumulative impacts and plan measures to counteract the losses. Remember the principle of the like for like, and uh, like many of the um, many of you working with ecosystem restoration, when we refer to integrated land use planning in here, the fact that this integrated land use planning has a spatial component is very important as well. So say if we if we we were thinking in terms of this was uh, well now over two years ago we were thinking in in our um, in our uh, commission how that principle of LDN could um, could guide some of the work of our uh, expert working group and my my fellow colleague Peter Laban um, did um, did two years ago a presentation thinking with me on on how we in, we can embed the concept in, in, in our strategy, in our work. So say, if we apply the concept of the vision for us, uh, would be that a dry land ecosystem are sustainable man sustainably managed and um, to, to maintain the natural capital. So any work that we would do, we try to uh, increase or sustain or to maintain the amount and the quality of the land resources that are necessary for the ecosystem functions and services that dry lands provide, and also to enhance food security in that ecosystem. Um, we were working um, on what might be targets. So say for us at that time, targets could be that uh, we want to improve knowledge on the status of or, or the threats of dry lands as ecosystems. But as important for us, one of the targets was around um, synthesis of knowledge, how we could benefit from, from um, a practice and, and, and science uh, uh, that, that teach us how best to how to best design interventions, implement them, and make them uh, sustainable over time. Um, and the importance for us of, of why the LDM framework was good also for us was because of that uh, of the concept of land type and land potential, which in our case we we were focusing, for instance, on on the land type on rangeland as a land type. And we we began working. Then Peter began working with some projects where he tried to apply that concept at a sub-regional level. And we did some some work with the Global um, Dry Line Initiative of the IUCN, uh, reflecting uh, on on LDN and the links with dry lands. So say here, um, this would be these are the modules on the left of the of the LDN, and as and you see, we we can for any ecosystem that we work on, we can set a vision and a goal. In, in this case, this would be our vision on how we want our, our dry land ecosystems uh, to be sustainably managed, to, to, have, uh, to maintain the natural capital, and what are the goals, the final goals. Um, so you can apply this, uh, this frame of work to, to the case of dry lands, uh, at, in different regions and uh, at national level, if you like that to be the case. And at the end of the day, we have a, a, a framework that is standardized where we can share knowledge or we can share the learnings from different experiences in, in applying those interventions. I um, was looking at the time conscious of time. So say um, this, is, this could be an example of, of a framework. If your focus is on having land degradation neutral, say rangelands, we would be looking at what are at, what are the drivers of uh, of changing rangelands ecosystem, and we can include things uh, looking and things as 
the governance of rangelands. Um, you can include the things that are related to knowledge around the pressures. Um, we know that less, uh, we say less pressure help to recover rangelands. The state of the rangelands, um, although at these days we still lack good knowledge or good maps or good, yeah, good, good maps I would say on the state of rangelands, but there are other areas um, that uh, UCN works on that we thought uh, could be important. For instance, um, having more work done on, on drylands and and the red lease, uh, red lease of ecosystems, uh, how, what is the state of rangelands if we applied um, that knowledge, say, from, from IUCN on the red lease of ecosystems. Um, the enhancement of the, or applying the LDN principle of avoiding, reducing, uh, or, or reversing brings benefits that are healthy dry land ecosystems, and those benefits will um, support effective responses. Those responses might be policy tools that could be around uh, market-based instruments uh, that could guide more sustainable investment on rangelands, but on rangelands um, and, and ensure that uh, healthy ecosystems are preserved. But if we understand or if we design um, uh, interventions around LDN that can maintain or enhance those, those benefits or, or those healthy um, drylands ecosystems over time, the, the policy responses, if well designed, should be tackling or should be addressing the drivers, which is where you endure change, where you make governance systems more, uh, more um, uh, stronger over time. Um, and you are not only track, uh, tracking what we say, the, the immediate pressures, you, you, you look into making um, by these responses, you look, you look into making the LDN concept of enabling environment um, more enduring over time. Um, so the other thing that I put in my talk, now I'm, I'm moving a bit, uh, the other thing I put in my talk was uh, around um, whether, say, this was in a nutshell, the LDN conceptual framework and an example of how it can adapt to works of uh, IUCN commissions like, um, like mine and how it can guide um, work that we do. But the other question now is a, a big chunk of, okay, we, we work as a commission on those things. Do we have all the knowledge that is necessary? Uh, what we need more if we want to apply this concept of LDN um, across the rangelands or across the drylands of the world. Um, and for that, I think there are a couple of important things which are around uh, knowledge generation. So we, as a scientist, we have a lot of, or we have accumulated uh, evidence and, and for some of the for some of the interventions, all the scientific and the practical uh, knowledge uh, or most of the scientific and practical knowledge uh, is there. It's just how you combine it according to the circumstances. And is there where I say, well, that the, the important thing is um, the quality of the interpretation. Um, so you could have um, evidence from best practice, the scientific evidence, local and indigenous knowledge, the way you combine and you interpret that that quality of interpretation is what can produce uh, what we say uh, policy relevant language uh, and or you can translate that knowledge not only on on practical action but actions but also on, on policy relevant language or what can influence what we say what can influence um, the the responses part of the deep sea framework that I was showing before so the the Policy relevant language is what I said, well, is how I do translate that knowledge into something that can um, give me uh, tools to, to make change or to make, um, yes, to make interventions that will last or, over time, not only for the lifetime of the project. So that was, uh, that was the question of knowledge. So I say here, well, what is the next thing? I now want to bring in a bit of the um, knowledge or, or, the, or, or what I have learned um, about the best way to, or, or one good way to, to use or to capitalize on knowledge that we have and how that knowledge is important for 
uh, what we call the adaptive learning um, or the triple loop learning within the LDM framework, but also is through my work in the science and technical advisory panel of the of the global environment facility, how that um, that synthesis of knowledge becomes important when you want to design projects that will be uh, sustainable over time. Um, so that's the, the next bit that I put here. And I went back then to the LDN logical framework. So the, the logical framework for the land degradation neutrality um, or we, that sometimes we refer like is the theory of change. This is what, what we want to achieve through LDM. Um, in the case of, of rangelands, this is, these are the kind of impacts that you'd like to do. To, do to, to achieve those impacts at the end of the day, we need um, learning that is uh, adaptive learning. So you, you have your initial knowledge, you have your assumptions, you, you learn as you apply, but you have to always, you might need to go back to adjust over time, whether your assumptions were the right ones, where you have have some disruptions that um, have um, hamper or that uh, means that you cannot apply the, the kind of interventions you, you were looking at, or whether through your monitoring system, you also learn that some of the actions uh, are not achieving the, the the outputs that were initially sought of. So the concept of, uh, of learning and monitoring is central to LDN. And, and this is something that then I, I learned from uh, my work with the staff um, when we were making recommendations for how to make projects, uh, countries can work in projects that could achieve uh, transformational change. And when I say transformational change, we always say that the concept of land degradation neutrality is, is transformational in itself because we are no longer looking at changes that are incremental. If we want to achieve land degradation neutrality uh, or we strive to achieve land degradation neutrality by 2030, there are many changes that we will need or countries will need to enact that are more towards the transformational rather than inc the incremental end. So what we did um, a report for the council last year and, and we, one of the things that we we were advising is that if we wanted to in, to have an enduring outcomes out of projects that are funded by the global environment facility whether in dry lands or other ecosystems to have um multi multi stakeholder platforms and established um, systems that are are able to monitor evaluate um to capitalize on the learning and and the the knowledge management process are key to any successful uh, project uh, outcome that looks into, um, into outcomes that um, can stay over time. So the, the, the enduring outcomes that we call it. Um, so we, we, we also were looking into what makes, um, what makes in, in a project life cycle, what makes um, the, the importance of having these multi-stakeholder platforms. And in those, um, people, our colleagues from the global mechanism, they, they do develop land degradation neutrality oriented projects, uh, having in mind that um, they need to work in multi-stakeholder platforms, they need to work with local communities, they need uh, all these, uh, appraisal and preparatory work for any project uh, and through the project lifetime uh, with an engagement of local community and relevant officials. So that is part of the of the enabling environment uh, for an LDN project in, in, in for the design of an LDN project. Um, so that is important also for good governance. And uh, it's important also for the for enduring um, the the outcomes because the earlier you engage stakeholders or communities, the more the higher the chances to uh, to create a sense of own ownership and to address uh, aspects of innovation that you want to to bring through your project and to enable to enable learning, not just um, 
I transfer knowledge one way, but to enable this two-way learning that is so important, uh, at least for um, projects on LDN that are focused on dry lands. So that's um, that's what we learned, and and we say it always that any project for the scaling of any project for the replication and to to in, to increase the speed at which uh, change need to happen, so say this transformational change that we speak about, uh, we we have to talk about scaling, and for us within the staff we. We work with this concept of um, the three types of scaling that need to happen. And these three types of scaling needs to happen in projects that focus on land degradation neutrality and work on dry lands. The scaling up is the one that uh, where we try that any LDN intervention will have impacts on, on, on governance, on law and policy. Important for us is also the scaling out. So whenever you discover that there are projects that have worked or there are interventions that work very well, that you are able to, uh, to spread, to, to have this adaptation to, to, and transfer to new contexts. But as important for dry lands and for LDN is the concept of the scaling deep. Because of what I said earlier, there are um, many, uh, uh, they are a, dry lands are a pot of unique cultures. They preserve culture. They preserve indigenous and local knowledge. Um, and they sometimes uh, we we tend to use only science based narratives. We need to, um, if we want to endure change and to make things happen in the right way. Many times we need to to do this scaling deep. So what we need uh, we need to identify what needs to change. Um, not only in, in relationships uh, with, say, doing a good, a different practice in, in how you manage land, but also to understand uh, why people manage land in the way they do. So that has to do with changing relationships, with, with um, understanding cultural values and beliefs, and, and how then in that way, with that understanding, you, you enact, uh, you, you have this uh, shift in norms and beliefs that we say are supportive of positive innovations. So for this, these are, um, when we speak about scaling and transformation for LDN um, and in dry lands, for instance, these are the three types of scaling that we, we speak about. Um, so previous to the last one, so why? I, now I'm at the end. So why um, I spoke about LDN, the concept of LDN, the, import, the importance of dry lands, uh, went also to the importance of having um, a focus on how we can capitalize for knowledge, how we connect, transfer, um, and share knowledge that we have about dry lands and how to manage dry lands in more sustainable ways. Um, I go back as to now the why I is again remembering that we have had coming out of the COP26, uh, we have new targets of um, coming out from the Convention on Biological Diversity. We have a forthcoming uh, COP of the UN Convention to Combat the Certification, where um, dry lands are, are central, are central for all of those conventions to advance uh, their mandate for countries to be able to work towards delivering on those uh, on mandates uh, or or or, uh, um, or the compromise uh, compromise that were done for for some of those conventions. One third of the earth is dry lands. Um, they are critical for food security. Many, many of, uh, as I said earlier, the canary on the mine, many projected uh, changes in climate will affect dry lands. Uh, dry lands can become uh, a lab to try new or innovative ways to address, uh, to make communities more resilient, to, be, to make ecosystems more resilient. About 51% of the world conservation hotspots include dry lands. And overall, uh, they tend to be because they they have been historically perhaps more 
more widely neglected as a key ecosystem until people had discovered that uh, they have huge potential, for instance, for soil organic carbon sequestration. Um, so for, for us, um, that's an important point on, on, why, uh, on why, the, the focus, why the focus of this commission, why this commission is important within um, uh, the Commission on Ecosystem Management, and how, again, this commission also, this uh, working group offers um, a lot of opportunities to, to collaborate with other of the IUCN working groups that are within the, the ecosystem management commissions. Um, so in a nutshell, to close up my, my talk, because I think I have been going now over yeah, a lot of time, is um, the LDN is, is a framework and a concept that uh, can help to avoid, reduce, reverse, restore drylands. Um, when we look at drylands from a lens of the socio, as the, of the socio-ecological system, there are plenty of know-how, tools, uh, knowledge uh, from different um, different types of knowledge. Um, that knowledge is key to develop interventions that suit the different uh, contexts of, of dry lands around the world. Um, and how we do apply and share that knowledge is important for the durability of the project outcomes. And I, I make again um, an emphasis on, on this aspect of sustainability or durability of project outcomes that, uh, that are important for, for the for land degradation neutral dry lands. So with that, I this is the end of the story. Uh, this is where we started. Um, and, and this is what IUCN said at the last COP. And I think uh, that's the truth. Dry lands are globally important and they are a good source of restoration. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. And uh, I hope we can have, a, in the time that remains, that we could have a, an exchange or that you have some questions for me. Thank you for your attention. Graciela, thank you so much for speaking so eloquently about dry lands, especially given that you started at four o'clock in the morning, your time. That was a fantastic overview presentation. And thank you to all the participants who logged in. We had individuals from all continents many different countries participating, and I will be sharing the chat with Graciela so she'll have a chance to see who joined us. There were a few resources shared, and we do have questions, which I'll ask you in a minute. We have about 10 minutes until the end of the hour. Uh, we may take a little bit more time for the question and answer session, but if you need to, participants, if you need to drop off, of course, you know we respect your time, feel, feel free to leave. Um, there was a question about um, resources for further understanding, and specifically, uh, Sean Muga asked whether there's anything in the IUCN portal on dry land ecosystems that could help. Yes, we, I, um, in my last slide, and I can send you, I, I will collate and send around. Um, we have produced with the global um, uh, global dry lands program of the IUCN, we did produce in the past some publications around land degradation, neutrality, and dry lands. And there are plenty of resources from the most basic that puts the emphasis on why dry lands are so important. There is one publication that we did uh, the, the, the dry land specialist group with the global dry lands on soil biodiversity, where we really make a focus on the importance of dry lands uh, for soil organic, uh, for soil biodiversity and in tandem, you know, soil organic carbon sequestration. And that is, has been translated into three languages. So that is available in French, Spanish, and English. Ah, fantastic. So yeah, yes. if you get those resources to- I will, call, I will collate them over the weekend, uh, send it to you, Karen, Perfect. so that you can send it with all the, all the colleagues. Yeah, so we'll have a follow-up. Thank you for joining yes. the webinar and it will go out with that. And um, Sean Muga, thank you so much for that question. We have a couple of really difficult questions concerning Let's see if, I, if, if I am uh, <laughs> concerning drivers. These are things you mentioned, yes. but just for a little bit deeper, we'll start with Clive asks, how does one deal with drivers like uncontrolled mining activities that are prominent in mismanaged gold rich 
sub-Saharan Africa, particularly where that activity is only one that can temporarily alleviate rampant poverty in a collapsing economy. Big challenge that land use planning is highly compromised with the added collapse of government. Yes. Um, we could talk half an hour about that. So I will try to make my very short answer. And again, I will put the resources uh, that could help with, with, that, um, uh, with that answer. You will send me uh, all the, the chat so I can, uh, I can address it. Yes, um, that is precisely, I mean, this is one of the reasons why the importance of the land degradation neutrality conceptual framework and the understanding of the anticipated losses and where you need to, to plan uh, gains to maintain that game of uh, land degradation neutrality at a country level. It's unavoidable, as you said. Yeah. Um, what you need first uh, is, uh, well, what you need, you won't address. What you, you ask me is, you're right. You have to, it's a livelihood. So if you are going to, to promote that that livelihood needs to change, you need first good governance in place. You need a vision, again, of uh, having good land use planning. And if you are not going to have that livelihood, what are the alternative ones? And where you can plan for those alternative ones and how you make that happen. So that goes around the concept. We In the LDN conceptual framework, we work with 19 principles the principle of good governance and the principle of engagement and the principles of, you know, having this preliminary assessment of the baseline is key. Things like what you say, John, they come up when you do the preliminary assessment. But then once you do that preliminary assessment, you need also to plan uh, or to how, you know, what, what are the alternative livelihoods? So I, I, I get uh, what you say and governments usually say to us, well, um, I, I know this question goes to say, well, it's all nice in theory, but you have a national development plan. Mm -hmm. you, this is the only livelihood. What we argue is that if you plan, if you, if you have alternatives in, in, and you, if you involve, for instance, bis, better involvement of businesses, of private sector, of uh, communities, you can make some of these um, community-based management uh, alternatives that could give new livelihoods. But this is not a, a change that happens in a short time frame. These are changes that take time. And that's why also my, my emphasis that my, did, my, might be a bit, uh, yeah, was a bit like sketchy or eclectical, but I think having worked with um, looking into projects, I also think that it's so important that that you work with your in your in the back of your mind with that concept of durability and the scaling, the understanding. Because to answer your question is this scaling out, up, and and deep. Some of the things you're saying are cultural changes that you would need to enact uh, and not on people, on governments as well. Um, so that, that takes uh, good planning and, and, and a lot of time. So it, you, you need to have uh, articulated not only the intervention, but all the framework that will sustain that intervention of, over time. And that has to do with political, social and economic context, not only the biophysical. And sorry for the long answer. No, that was an excellent answer. And there's another question that I think what you just said is applicable to, but I'm going to read the question anyway, because it's a little bit of a different angle. And this is Becca, who says, does the LDN approach, as well as any ecosystem restoration initiative, not assume uniform land ownership with numerous landowners across a landscape with varying interests and expectations from the land parcels they own, it becomes a bit of a challenge to convince them for buy-in. And here's the question. How do you recommend we deal with the element of land ownership to avoid planning for others, but rather to plan with them? Integrated land use planning. Um, I will. Uh, I will also lead you to the UNCCD Knowledge Hub that has plenty of resources, and I'm now um, collaborating with a team of the Science Policy Interface because we are working 
on just what you say, John, it's all about, um, we recognize that uh, early engagement, but also there are different systems of governance. You might have uh, traditional uh, and dif different systems of tenure. Um, so the LDN uh, principle, can, uh, there are principles that look into tenure and access and land rights. Um, and then it's, it's expected that if you go through the traditional principles, principles of integrated land use planning, one of them is participatory land use planning, where you engage and work with the local people. Um, and that's, again, I will go back to my scaling in out and, you know, the deep, the scaling up, scaling out and scaling deep. If you engage with communities and if you understand, uh, as, as, as he was saying, you know, you plan, it's not that I come from the science field and I plan what I think is best for that land type. Um, it's the local and the traditional knowledge that has to be also exploited and integrated if you want a solution that will, that will create that sense of ownership. And once you create that sense of ownership in the solution, it's easier the implementation and you can warranty more durable outcomes because the community embraced that and feels included and it's not something that has been imposed into you. So the LDN framework accounts for that in one of the 19 principles. It's about different systems of governance and different systems of um, uh, access and rights. And even we had, I, I, I did contribute to a publication of creating gender responsive land degradation neutrality um, uh, interventions, because that's the other aspect. Uh, where are women? Where, where do we sit? In many of the traditional systems, women have no voice. Uh, so how you ensure that they also benefit or are part of the decision-making process? Fantastic. And you actually answered Mohammed's question about inclusion of indigenous and local knowledge in the LDN approach. I yes. want to remind folks, we are right at the hour. If you have to go to your next engagement, we'll stay on a little bit with Graciela. We'll take about 10 more minutes to um, have more conversation with her. Uh, and there's some interesting um, questions that have come in on implementation issues. Feel free to drop off. I do want to note importantly that we will not be holding the webinar in December. We hold the webinar the third Friday of each month. We're pausing for December because it's a holiday season in many regions. We'll see you all in January. We have a fantastic presentation lined up from the Finance Task Force of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Okay, so you mentioned scaling quite a bit and Madav asked a question. Um, the global, here's a comment and then a question. The Global Landscape Forum event held on the sideline of COP26 has advocated to landscape management framework to manage different types of land uses in an integrated and sustainable manner. What scale would you recommend for a dry land landscape management given a relatively homogeneous land form in dry lands compared to say forest ecosystems. And then he had a follow-up question, how to scale up and scale out successfully uh, LDN focused on dry lands. And apologies, Madov, for a little bit of butchering of your question. Did that come through, Graciela? Yeah, we'll try to answer, let's see. Okay. Um, first, first the last. Um, yes, we have some, um, in the UN, in the GEF, in the for the scientific, technical, and advisory panel, we did a, a, a publication that again I will show, share with the team on um, scaling up, out, and, and deep. And I know the the work at the World um, Conservation Database uh, that has a base in Geneva. They have done approach and they have produced a very good publication on um, scaling for durability. So I can make that resource available to you. Um, then the question of the scale of application because of dry lands. With the LDN, we say that any of the interventions you plan, let's say, let's, let's 
look at two things. One is planning, the other is, is management. So you need to plan your land use planning, your integrated land use planning, um, where you will design your LDN interventions. We advise strongly that it be at national level. Why that is because you might say, I'm going to, to, to make this dry land, a, a land degradation neutral, and then you are, you are prompting leakage into other ecosystems. And that has happened in some countries where uh, some ecosystems were protected at the expenses of the next one that was going then uh, to be the subject of the new next mm. agricultural uh, frontier and whatnot. So you plan your intervention for LDN at a national, at a country level with all the ecosystems you have there. Then you focus on your dry land. For the ecosystem of dry land, we, we say your approach is the landscape um, scale. And in there is where comes the question of the land type. So we said any, as you say, in, you were saying they are rather homogeneous. So any, you might aggregate by catchment. Some countries work at a catchment scale. So you might aggregate catchment. The important part is that you look at uh, the same land type. And um, in the LDN conceptual framework, we define the concept of same land type. Is the land type the same, same geoforms, uh, soil types, similar uh, vegetation types? Uh, so it's, it, you work on that question of the similarity from a biophysical perspective, because that is what will inform the potential. So it's not it's not looking at, um, okay, I have a land use here. No, it's looking at if you are going to propose something to avoid, to reverse, or to restore, you will look at the potential of that land. Because maybe there is no point for you in trying to promote a scheme of, say, soil carbon sequestration in, an eco in a dry land ecosystem that has no potential for that. So that's a concept of it's important for us that um, that you, you know, when you apply this concept that you understand that you're looking into the same line type as, as you said, Cara, but also on what is the potential of that land, which equates to the concept of the US of land capability, for instance, mm -hmm. it's, it's a closet. So you're looking, but countries have different. In Australia, we talk about Ibra regions, in interim biogeo bioregional geographic regions, I think that's the name. But that's the important part. So um, the scale of intervention, then we say it's always an IUCN, um, the global dry lands, and, and us, we did some publications on the importance of landscape, landscape scale approach. And also why the landscape scale approach, because you also need to work here with the concepts that sometimes landscape are multifunctional. So it's not to say that you will use it only for one and one thing. So that's a, the, the suggested scale of, of intervention. I'm not sure if I did answer your question, but feel free to ask me more. No, that was excellent. Okay, we're gonna end on a big question. It's from Gabriel who says, thank you for the presentation. And by the way, there was a lot of congratulations in, in the chat and thank you for the presentation. And Gabriel says, the Society for Ecological Restoration's international principles and standards consider the restoration concept with the aim to achieve substantial recovery of a native ecosystem. And I'll go further and I'll also post a link to the society's uh, international principles and standards. Yes. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, and Graciela, you may not be familiar, but the idea within the standards is that the aim of restoration is to partially or fully recover a native ecosystem to the condition it would have been in now if degradation hadn't occurred. So that accounts for past environmental change. So for instance, Restoration is clearly not about holding ecosystems stable in any past point in time, but rather removing the degradation and um, recovering the system to the condition it would have been in without degradation, accounting for environmental change. Okay, so here's the question, however, is about this moving forward. With um, the climate change, reshaping the ecosystem and then some areas more than others, some native species won't be able to be restored. Then the restoration targets or goals from some countries won't be achieved. 
uh, do you think the concept requires change or perhaps working on policy development to adapt the concept for the local context will be enough? Will the funds and results focus that, you know, that are devoted to restoration be affected? So that's a big question and I thought it would be a fun one to kind of end on. Yeah, look, um, yes, Gabriel, you, you, we are uh, aware, aware and there was a letter in Nature and Science when, when the land degradation neutrality framework was published around that concept on the definition we, we get in the glossary about restoration. And we use the, the by the way, we use um, the concept of uh, land restoration that is used there. But I, I want to share one minute screen because I, what Gabriela asked is around uh, this slide here. Oh gosh. Um, see when you want to go to the slide that you wanted. Oh, this one here. Okay, yeah. This is where the Society of Ecological Restoration definition sits, right? No, actually. This, the Society for Ecological Restoration has made a big point that restoration is not recovery to the pre-disturbance ecosystem. Rather, it's recovery to the condition or state that the system would have been in today if it had not been degraded. And this is okay. very important because we see for, for decades, really, people being confused about the concept of restoration, that it is about holding ecosystems stable at a past point in time. Oh, we just need to figure out what the ecosystem was like 100 years ago before the degradation, and then that's what we managed to. And so the SCR principles and standards have very clearly defined restoration I believe the way that you have designed, uh, I believe exactly as shown here. Yes, um, that's well, uh, just to say, we did, we advise or, or the LDM framework advise that the principles be applied. But I think to, to it's a big debate, but to answer Gabriel, I would say that um, the, the goodness is that the LDN let you work in this space, as I said earlier. Um, there might be instances where it's not possible that you restore to the condition that would have been, as Cara said, if you know, if there would have not been restoration. And then it's where you begin to talk about the concept of land rehabilitation. So there are context, places and spaces where you, you, you are able to restore and where a country financially um, uh, might have the financial, the human capital to do these big restoration projects. But we need to also be conscious that there are other instances where restoration is simply not feasible. And even if you look into, into the projected um, uh, climate change or you know they, there is no way that you might be able to restore in the future. Um, some colleagues begin to talk about then the concept of novel landscapes uh, or, or where it uh, or where you, you know some then you would aspire that some of your target trajectories around implementing the land degradation neutral concept will be on restoration. Uh, but all that are, are large chunk might be on rehabilitation. And that's why, for instance, the concept of land use planning is so important because there, if the land potential at the state, you know, at the, at the current baseline of how the land is at present might not be um, a good intervention to plan for restoration because it's simply you would not achieve perhaps given the time frame, given the financial resources. So you'd look into reestablish perhaps the ecosystem uh, functions and the, uh, the ecosystem, you know, the functions and, 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 and ecosystem services that the land can provide without going to the very basic or, or, or the guiding principles of land restoration. Bottom line, what you want is that you would not 
go beyond or, or you would not go underneath this line. So you don't want to continue the decline. You want to work in this field here. Um, so that's what we, we said even when we work with projects, now with my heart of having to assess projects, there are instances where where you simply can, you know, you are guided by all these principles. They have to inform your decisions, but the reality tells you that I don't think you can restore land to the concept that is defined for. And, and, and this is where I, I think that, you know, a scientist need to have that uh, reality check sometimes when we say, well, this is the ideal situation. But if we, if we are working in X, Y, or Z uh, context, uh, this is this is what the best we can do, and the best we can do at least you know the minimum is maintain, maintain the services, maintain the the health of that ecosystem, or bring it back to the best that you you know as through rehabilitation bring it back to to a basic functioning so that the services are provided. But I know that this is contentious with some um, with some people that are working in ecological restoration. This is not you know, it's, it's not acceptable. Well, apologies, my light is going on and off here. Um, this is a great place to end. And I'm really pleased to report that I think the restoration community is coming to a, a sort of global agreement on how to define terms. And I'll just note that for the decade on ecosystem restoration, the definition of ecosystem restoration includes a continuum of activities from activities that are reducing adverse impacts in production landscapes all the way to ecological restoration, recognizing the need for this broad umbrella of different types of ecosystem repair, but also saving space for exactly. full recovery in the places where that's possible. And so if you haven't seen it, there's a nice um, set of work that IUCN, CEM participated in along with FAO and the UN Decade and the Society for Ecological Restoration and UNEP on principles for ecosystem restoration. And they're a nice companion for the document I just posted on standards and practice for ecological restoration. I know that's a jumble of terms. We want me to wrap up. I invite all of you to consider joining CEM. I posted in the chat how you do that. I'll leave um, the chat window open for a little bit. When you join, you then have the opportunity to join different thematic and specialist groups within IUCN's Commission on Ecosystem Management, that's yes. CEM. And so you can select the dryland group. We also, yes. of course, have the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group, which sponsors this webinar series. Appreciate all of you joining us. Great questions and comments. Yes. Professor Graciela, thank you so much for your time again. It's really been a My pleasure to spend the time with you. And um, all of you have a great couple months. We hope to see you in January. Yes, everybody have a, a, a good, good end of the year. And, uh, and thank you very much for joining. I, I really appreciate and um, only emphasizing that uh, we always look for more hands for more people that are interested. So if any of the listeners today uh, would be interested to join our uh, dryland specialist group, more than welcome. Um, we need more hands to make these things happen. I'll post in the chat again information on CEM membership. And there is a four year um, period for members. If you are a member right now, if you're not aware, you do need to reapply for the next um, IUCN session. And there's in the chat. Um, Perfect. And, and I will collate and send um, all, the, all the resources I have about LDN and, uh, and about Rylands and um, any other uh, resource that I can see that inform my presentation. Thank you, Cara, but, for Graciela, inviting me. Don't do it over the weekend. Do it when no, you're at We'll be work. done by Monday. <laughs> Next week, take a few days, we'll wait, we can send the announcement out. Oh, and I was remiss in saying that we do post these on YouTube. 
you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you click the little notification icon, then you will get a YouTube notification when videos post. Okay, that's a wrap. Thanks so much, Thank everyone. Have a good Enjoy day, the weekend. Bye. Thank you, Graciela. Have a nice weekend, everybody. You too. Bye.